Welcome everybody to this Digital Technologies webinar from the ACA. Today's session will be focusing on digital technologies for primary school teachers. And we will be talking about how to teach coding free online with the DT challenges. My name is Nicola O'Brien and I'm one of the educators in the team. And today I'll be co-presenting with Sujatha Gunja, who is another computing education specialist and also a lecturer in digital technologies at the University of Sydney. Hi everyone, welcome along and thanks for watching with us. What we'd like to do today is that we will be um, talking about how you can get started with uh, teaching coding using the ACA resources at your school. So we will begin with a quick overview from Sujatha about coding and where it sits in the Australian curriculum, digital technologies. Uh, once we have honed in on that topic, we will have a look at the Grok Learning platform and how you can sign up and create an account as a teacher and some of the features that you have access to in that teacher dashboard. Um, after that, we will be demonstrating some of the DT challenges for you. Um, and if you are watching this at home at that point, we'd really encourage you to pause the webinar and to sign into those challenges your uh, by yourself and have a go through them so that you can see them in action and start to think about how you might use those in the classroom. Uh, once we've demonstrated the challenges, we are going to step back a little bit and talk about uh, how you would go about choosing the right course for your students. Uh, we'll be looking at things like curriculum coverage, uh, the ages and bands that the courses are prepared for, and some of the supporting materials that are available to you as a teacher. Um, finally, we will talk briefly about how you can get your students enrolled in the challenges, uh, technically how you go about signing them up and also how you can monitor their progress through the courses from your teacher dashboard. Um, and as this is a recording, we won't have the benefit of a live Q&A, but we will share with you all the ways that you can get in touch with us so that we can help you after you've watched the webinar with any residual questions that you have. Um, so with that in mind, I would like to hand across to Sujatha, who's going to talk to us about coding and where it fits into the curriculum. Okay, right. So today we're going to uh, start by talking about coding and where it fits within the digital technologies uh, curriculum. So coding uh, is one of those areas that uh, a lot of teachers are quite um, uh, worried about in terms of how they're going to be able to teach it and exactly how to support uh, students. So today we're just going to uh, place it in context of the broader digital technologies curriculum. So if you look at the um, uh, the website aca.edu.au slash curriculum, we've got uh, a whole bunch of resources on there. And one of the things that the curriculum team, the writing team have done is take the uh, entire Digital Technologies National Curriculum content descriptors and they've broken it down into uh, these 10 big ideas in digital technologies and we call them the key concepts and they range from uh, some of the more practical hands-on types of skills which coding certainly falls into to more of the conceptual types of um, learning that students are required to have like abstraction. So if we scroll further down this page, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of icons and um, the coloring uh, will become important because we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but coding really fits into the key concept called implementation. And for each one of them uh, across, you can see the expectations for each of the band levels. So the uh, expectation for F2 is that there is no explicit uh, expectation around coding uh, in that band level. So some of you primary teachers, um, if you're uh, looking at how you might be able to do coding in F2, uh, there are some resources out there, but the curriculum does not expect you to do that. Um, there are some expectations that kick in from years three to four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, ten, and they really scale up in terms of what the students should be able to learn um, and what they should be able to do as far as programming uh, is concerned. So coding is uh, in one way, if you think about it, it is one tenth of the digital technologies curriculum, but it uh, often is a little bit more than that because it's quite closely tied to some of the other key concepts, say like algorithms, uh, where students need to model a solution in one way before they actually start programming it. So what are the expectations from 
uh, years three to six. So in years three to six, uh, students are expected to write a code-based solution to a simple problem. The word simple can be um, dependent on your context and obviously dependent on your students as well. Once students write the problem, they're expected to test it using a variety of methods uh, and students need to use a visual programming or block-based language. Uh, the concepts or the constructs that they need to learn about is uh, learn how to accept user input in their code. Uh, their code needs to be able to handle decisions. So what would it do if this happens or that happens or something else happens? Uh, and how to make a block of code repeat itself so that you're not having to rewrite the same set of code uh, hundreds of times. Uh, so there's a lot more in there. So for further information, um, you can head into the uh, unpacking um, the curriculum section on the ACA website and it's got loads of resources to help you really understand the expectations uh, around coding from years three to six. So I will hand it back to Nicola and we'll just sort of go to the next slide. We've done that uh, and on to creating your teacher accounts. Thank you Sujatha. Um, so creating a teacher account is a simple process the ACA partners with another organisation, Grok Learning, and that is where you'll find our online programming courses. So we'll take a look at that website briefly now. Here we are on Grok Learning. Um, you can see I'm already signed in on the website. If I sign back out of there, you have an option to register here. Now, the important thing to do when you register for the first time is to make sure that you register yourself as a teacher. So we have different levels of registration. And here I'll say that I'm a teacher. Create the password, make it memorable, but not something other people can guess. And here we are. So once you create the account, you'll end up on this page here. Uh, the first thing you'll do, you'll receive an email and you'll be able to verify your account. Step one here is the one that I really wanted to focus on for today, which is to request teacher verification. Now, without verification, you can still look at our courses and try them, but verification is the step which unlocks you access to your students' data. So if you would like to create a class on the Grok Learning platform, assign students into courses and check their progress in a certain course, you must be verified. And what verification looks like, it's a manual process from our end. We will actually call or approach the school that you're at to confirm that you are indeed a teacher at that school. And that allows us to then grant you access to the data from your students. So that is the process of getting started. Once you have signed up and created your account, you can have a look at any number of the courses that we have available. Step three is registering students, which we are going to look at later in the webinar. Now I'm going to take a look back on the ACA website now. Once you have created your account, then it's time to think about what you're going to allocate to the students. So before we do a demonstration of coding, I'll just show you briefly how we chose the course and where we accessed it from, and then we're going to pause and show you some live coding in a couple of our different courses. Most teachers find our resources page the best place to start. So aca.edu.au forward slash resources shows you all of the activities that we have authored as a team. Uh, and we have filters along the side. So if I'm a year three, four teacher, now I can see everything that we've authored these descriptions here tell you about the activities and for online coding courses, it's DT challenges and DT mini challenges are the ones that will take you straight into that Grok Learning platform to have a look. So if I'm a year three, four teacher, Blockly Wombot looks interesting to me. I can say, go to the challenge. And you'll see with my newly minted account, I'm in a new version of the Wombot course and I can dive straight in and start coding. Now this teacher account is not verified yet, so I don't have access to all of the teacher aspects. I'll show you those shortly, but you can see from the ACA website, I've jumped straight across to Grok Learning and I can open one of the courses. 
It's going to ask me where I am. Here's my school. If your school's not in the list, that's okay. You can drop us an email. And I've started one of our DT challenges. Uh, what we thought we would do in today's webinar is demonstrate a couple of the challenges for you. So I'll show you some of the features of the Wombot course and Sujatha will then show you some of the features of a Blockly Microbit course, our sport challenge, which we particularly like. Is that right? I think so. <laughs> Checking it out. It's a good one. Um, it's a good one. So Wombot is a course that we developed for year three, four students. Uh, it's got very nice curriculum coverage, which we'll talk about after we've looked at the course itself. Um, to navigate the course, you can click on the hamburger menu there and you can see basically an index page for the entire course. Now there are a couple of symbols to get used to. Uh, the circular symbols mean that we're looking at a slide which provides information and some narrative content. The diamonds are problems. So these are things that the students asked to work on and submit code to the marker. You'll see there's a narrate icon. This is in some of our feature, uh, some of our courses, not all of them. Clicking on that gives you an audio narration. So very helpful for students whose reading level may not be uh, where the rest of the class is or who have English as a second language uh, or any number of reasons they might prefer to process the information um, in an auditory way rather than by reading. So once I've read this slide, I can click through. We have another slide. This course has a very nice gentle progression that explains that the Wombot is looking for carrots. Now, if you're watching this as a delayed recording, um, rather than hearing me take you through the course, I'd suggest that you pause now and go and sign yourself up to Grok Learning, open the course yourself and work through it with me and um, have a look at how it feels to experience it as a student. So the first thing we do on this slide is introduce students to how they can run code by clicking on this triangle. And you'll see that when I run code in this course, the emulator here shows us the Wombot following the instruction here, which says move forward 50 steps and the Wombot moves. Now, because I did something on that slide, I ran the code. This circle here is now turned green. That shows my progress through the course. I'll take you now to one of the problems. This is our first problem interface and you can see straight away it looks a little bit different. Uh, instructions are housed on the left hand side. Uh, here is an area, a canvas area where you can build your coding project and here is where you'll see the output of your project. So I start by reading my instructions. Now it's time to make your own program. The Wombot is hungry, the Wombot wants a carrot, there's a carrot 50 steps away. So change the move forward block to move Wombot 50 steps. And here I can see at the moment Wombot's moving 20. So I will change that to 50. If you notice the green, the number one went green and got a tick next to it, that means I've successfully completed step one. Step two says click run to run the program. Now, don't click here, that's a trick. Click up here where it says run. And you will see, here's my Wombot who followed my instruction and moved forward 50 steps, got to the carrot and left the little red line there. Now the final step's really important for you to, for your students to record their progress and have it captured in our system, they need to mark their problems, which is here. So when I click mark, it asks me to confirm. And our auto marker is going to compare the code that I created on this page with the model answer. It, I've passed all the tests, phew, I'm ready to move on. And I can see, I get a special message because this is a brand new account that I've made and this diamond is now green. So that's permanent progress saved. I can come back anytime, continue in the course and I will see my progress recorded there for me. Um, another couple of things to show you, there is an instruction section, often overlooked but very helpful. Uh, encourage your students to run through this. It will show them all the parts on the screen and where they can find out their progress and submit questions for marking. So we also have tutoring. Now this is something we're rolling out in our courses. It's a live tutoring in interface, which is available um, Australian Eastern Standard Time, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. And students can type messages to our tutoring team. 
So they might say, for example, I don't understand what to do here, please. Now, if I send that message, it will alert a tutor at the other end who will get the message, but will also access this version of the problem and see my code and where I'm up to. Our tutors are really well trained not to give the answer away. So they won't say type 50 steps and they will say, hmm, have you thought about how many steps the Wombot should take? Have you thought in a more complex question? They will just brainstorm and gently in a back and forth way try and guide the student towards the answer that they need to help them. So the Wombot course continues uh, to show you towards the end. One feature that we have in our courses is called a playground. This is a slightly different kind of problem. This is a place uh, with two purposes. So firstly, for students, when they get to the end of the course, they might want to create their own activity for the Wombot to do and create its own journey through its map. Uh, the second purpose is for you as a teacher. You may have a specific project you would like your students to work on and you will define that as a class and set a challenge. Students come into the playground and they can work here and show you the code. Now, because it's a playground, you can't automatically mark this obviously because we're not sure how you would like to use this, but it's a place for students to save their progress on a task that you might assign to them. So that's a brief overview of the Wombot course. I'm going to hand across to Sujatha, who's now going to show us one of our other courses, I think, to show you the contrast, I'm going to quickly sign out of Grok and sign back in. So now you can see a course from a teacher perspective, not just the student perspective, because there are some other additional features teachers will see. So let me do that briefly while Sujatha starts talking and then we will, which course would you like me to open Sujatha? Uh, the micro bit um, sport, please. Sport, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sign back in. Mm -hmm. So uh, the micro bit sport course uh, is uh, a challenge that we developed uh, aligned for years five and six. But as with many of our online challenges, um, if you have a student in year three, four who are particularly um, uh, able and are showing evidence of learning quite quickly, uh, you might uh, consider assigning them a challenge from an older year group. Or conversely, um, if you work in a K-12 school and you're normally teaching high schoolers um, and you have a student that might need a little bit uh, more support in their learning, um, you might be able to use a 5-6 challenge. Uh, just bear in mind though, the 5-6 challenges are written in a block-based language uh, and once students get to high school, the expectation is that they transition over year 7 and 8 into using more of the general purpose text-based language. Uh, so this is our microbit sport challenge. So I'm just going to um, grab control of Nicholas' screen, just so that I can navigate and cause all sorts of mischief on the laptop. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks, Nicola. Right. So uh, like the Wombot challenge, we have a little bit of an introduction. Um, it tells students what they're about to do. Uh, and this is one of those areas where um, it's really nice as a class to come together and set the tone for your students introduce to them, them to what they're about to do uh, and how they will be learning over the course uh, of doing this challenge. So on this uh, particular account that Nicola's logged into, you will see that we now have this additional tab called the teacher notes. So clicking on that gives you the information you need uh, as an educator uh, to think about the curriculum coverage. So we have this in a few different places, but you can look inside a course uh, and it'll show you where the lesson plans are, where it fits as far as the overall curriculum is concerned, uh, roughly um, how long it might take. Now, this is a very, very rough estimate, depending on um, how much support your students get, what prior knowledge they may have. But generally speaking, uh, our students complete this in anywhere between um, 8 to 15 hours. Uh, Microbit is a mini computer, and a lot of schools have chosen to buy it, but if you don't have it in your classroom, no dramas at all. We actually have an online simulator where your students can complete every single one of the problems uh, and do it really well. And it'll still give you the feedback uh, like Nicola showed you with the automated marking. Um, and eventually, if your students happen to have a micro bit, they can download the code and actually play with it um, in a physical sense as well. So I'm going to go back into the notes slide and I'm going to progress along. Um, this is a notes slide. It tells me what a micro bit is. Uh, gives me a bit more information about it. And again, if your students have the micro bit, it's a nice opportunity to tie to some of the other key concepts uh, around digital systems. 
so we can go through. Uh, and this is much more of a long-term kind of course. It's, it's got um, five different modules uh, and the students are taught all the skills they need to build uh, a version of an egg and spoon race by using this device, which is quite, um, quite a nice little challenge. So we're gonna do the first um, slide together. And again, because it's block-based, uh, it's a very gentle kind of uh, progression. And we assume in all our block-based courses that students may not have done programming before, so we teach them everything they need to know. Uh, if your students have done programming before, they will be able to get through these slides a little bit faster. So again, I'm gonna follow the instructions, drag the image block in there, and I get that feedback straight away when I've completed it. And we find that students uh, really respond quite well, uh, particularly when there is a little bit of text for them to get through. It's just that uh, visual feedback uh, for them to be able to track their learning. And then the next step is click plus. Uh, again, this is slightly tricky. It's not plus here, it's plus over here. It can be a little bit tricky to see. Uh, so again, this is one of those things that uh, you as a teacher would be really helpful to draw your students' attention to it, just so that uh, it's not one thing that they have to struggle through. So when we hit play, it actually shows me the happy face. So it's taken my code and it's run it on the simulator. And it tells me I finished it. And again, I get that feedback immediately and the slide has gone green because I've done the uh, steps on that. So I'm just gonna jump straight into a problem and again, so you'll now notice that this is very similar in terms of the layout to the Wombot challenge that uh, Nicola showed us earlier. So we try and keep the interface consistent between challenges, just so that um, once the students learn uh, the tool, they can actually concentrate on the learning. And we try and minimize uh, the amount of new things they have to learn on top of the concepts as well. So I'm going to uh, follow the instructions. Let's get the micro bit to show a smiley face. Now you'll notice that this is very uh, prescriptive. It's a very gentle step and that's exactly what you want in a first problem. Uh, once we go further down, uh, we take away some of those support just a little bit and make it uh, slightly more challenging for students, uh, but it'll still only always ever refer to concepts that they've learned. So again, I'm going to join the blocks together. I'm going to snap it into place and I get the feedback. I'm going to click run and my code runs. And then I'm going to click the mark button. Uh, it's very important that students do that because sometimes they get to this point and they think they finished it, but the system will not record it as a submission because they technically have not submitted uh, the program for marking. So I'm just going to hit submit and hurrah, um, I have written my first micro bit program. So we can go ahead and I can even pick up one of the other uh, problems further along, right? So now it's expecting me to do a little bit more. So you can see that we now have a few more steps uh, going further along. There are more commands introduced. Um, there is uh, a few problems here. And then we introduce some of the other concepts. So when I mentioned earlier about coding and expectations in the curriculum, uh, repetition and loops are expected in year five and six and therefore we teach it in this course. And we teach it very explicitly. We're telling them what it is, why it's needed. We show them an example in the micro bit. Students can play with that example, and then they apply those concepts and skills to a problem that is not different to what they've just done. So again, we keep the learning curve really, really gentle and accessible and approachable for students. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you on the screen is uh, you as a teacher um, have the teacher notes where we've unpacked the problem so you can explain it to your students that might be struggling. And this is uh, one of the things that teachers love is we've got sample solutions. And one of the nice things is um, uh, we recommend that you do the problems yourself as a teacher, just so that you know what it's like from the kid's perspective. But if you don't get through all of them, there is always a solution that you can refer to and compare what you've done um, and what, uh, what a student might be struggling with and point them um, towards the correct solution. You, can, uh, you don't have to recreate it. You can actually just click on the try button. It launches the code in here and you can run it and it'll be the model answer that we use behind the scenes to mark the student's work. Uh, because this is a five, six course, it's worth that we also have the text-based version of that appear here. So we've got the submission history. So when students submit it multiple times, they can see what they've done before they can see the output of what the code, code's result is. 
they can see the simulator on the micro bit um, so that they can uh, visualize what the code is doing on the device. But they also have a text-based version of this code that's on the screen in blocks. And we find it really useful for students, particularly around the year six, year seven level, who might be between uh, a text-based programming language or a block-based block, block language. Um, so for those students uh, of yours in year five or year six who are ready for the challenge, um, you might be able to get them to actually start unpacking what the relationship is between what they see on this panel versus what they see on this panel. And it's just uh, preparing them and getting them to think about code a little bit differently and getting them to think about the different rep representations we can use uh, in programming itself. And it ties to, again, one of our other key concepts. So while the focus in this week's webinar, in this webinar is mainly on coding, uh, there is actually quite a lot here that can help you as a teacher um, to tie and link back to some of the other key concepts that you are required to cover in the curriculum. And, um, and that's, I think, about all from me. So the, it goes on for a few more modules. We've got accelerometer, we've got loops, we show them how to do different types of displays. And then there's the final project that they can build towards, uh, they can get there. And again, similar to the other um, course, we have a little uh, playground and it's got a huge range of options in the drawer. And some of them they may not have covered in the course because um, it may not be the focus. For example, lists and so on, it really doesn't come into the curriculum till uh, much later on. But because it's a playground and we want students to be able to try and play with uh, all the different tools that they have at the disposal, uh, it's there. So this is quite a nice way for you to set your students special projects. We find that a few, few teachers use this as part of their, their summative assessment when they've completed a challenge. Um, and so these are just some of the different ways that you can incorporate the playground uh, into your teaching. And I think that's it. Nicola, was there anything else? No, I think that's really good coverage of it. I'll Thank you. So I'll hand that over back to Thank you, you and we can do the next part. Thank you. So the next thing I would like to show you um, is the side of getting students involved in the courses and some of the tools we have to monitor how your students are traveling through the challenges. Uh, if I come back to the Grok Learning homepage, actually let me come on this side. I'll go back to groklearning.com. And there is a button there, once you are verified as a teacher, called the Teacher Dashboard. Now we have a demo school set up, so you can see that. If I scroll down, these are the students that I have in my school. And Student Workshops is a group of 20 students. Now, if you would like to see what your students are working on, we have two main tools, and one of them is very new. So I'll show you that one first, which is our View Live. Now, if you're working remotely at the moment and you are running classes in real time, you may say to your students, for example, okay, it's 10.30 for the next hour, we're working through the micro bit challenge and we are going to work through it as a class. Now, the blue view live button lets you see what your students are actually doing. Let's see what that looks like. It's a very new product, so every time I look at it, it's different. <laughs> but here we are. Now, what you are seeing is each student involved in that class down the left hand side, um, a snapshot of when they were last active. So we set some data up a couple of hours ago that we could show you today. Um, and then you can see across the timeline, left to right, where the students are up to. Now we have some icons here. A green is successfully solving a problem. An orange is submitting a problem for marking but not getting the answer correct. And the gray um, ones with the eyes, which honestly, they're a little bit freaky, aren't they? But anyway, all feedback is good feedback, um, is when they've viewed problems and slides. Now, if someone's active in the course, you'll see down here that it will be gray, green, or orange. So students that are struggling will get this orange icon next to them, and you'll be able to see straight away that their last attempt on the platform was to solve a problem and they were unsuccessful with their answer. So student 10 might need a hand. The ones that are shown in green, they're tracking along just fine, and the ones in gray, I believe, uh, have viewed something, but not as recently, not as actively involved in the course. 
So this is a lovely tool if you want to see in real time what your students are up to. Now you may not need that level of overview of your students. You may have a longer time frame, say a week, to say, here's a course, I'll see you next week and we'll see how we're going. If that's the case, uh, the dashboard, if I click on student workshops, here again you can see the same students. Now there are several things you can do from this dashboard. You can assign courses to students. So if you think that the microbit course is definitely the one for you, you would either select all of them or just the students that you want to, click on the drop down, find the course that you would like to assign and select it and those students will be enrolled in the course. You can also do things like add more students to your class and so forth from the admin tab. From the assigned progress, you will see for all of the students in your group, everything that's been assigned to them and where the students are up to in that. Now, Sujatha, I believe, hides behind student workshop 18 and has been very diligent in the Wombot challenge this morning. So I can see that she deserves a big tick and maybe an extra long nap this afternoon because she's worked really hard on the Wombot. And here she is. Whereas I can see maybe student workshop 15, not much happening there. So this gives me a uh, less time sensitive, but it gives me an overview of exactly where the students are up to. The other thing I can do here, for example, student workshop 12 has an orange bar here for having submitted an incorrect answer. If I click there, I actually get a view of exactly what the student had in the screen for that problem. So I can actually look at their code in this view and see if I can help or have another look at the code. So I can see the problem says there's a carrot 150 steps away and I can see my student's code says move forth 120 steps. So I've identified the problem. I could now talk to my student about what they might need to change. Um, if you want to look at a specific course, you can do the same. You can come in here and find the one book course. And here we have a view just for a single course of progress for my students. This is where I would come if I wanted to get Sujatha her certificate for doing such a great job. And I can actually download a CSV file of, oh, apologies, I'm not sure what that one is there. I'll try again soon. Um, I can download certificates and also the marks so I can get a CSV table of my students progress through the course. So we have some powerful analytic tool for you as a teacher. Now that covers it in terms of student access. Let me just um, jump through a little bit and catch up. We've looked at the dashboard and the live progress. The other things we wanted to highlight to you today, we've shown you in the live demo, but just to reiterate that solutions are available to you within the challenges themselves. The other thing we would like to show you is the support that's available on the ACA website itself for you as a teacher. So we obviously have the online courses and feel free to jump in Sujatha if you want to add anything, but back on the ACA website now, Let's talk about what we have here to help you select a course, uh, to check the curriculum coverage, and also to support learning around that course. Mm -hmm. So on the resources page, as I mentioned before, you can choose things by year group and activity. One thing I didn't mention here was the curriculum detail on the courses. So if I'm interested in data representation to teach that course, I could click into that. I might stick with the micro bit one for now. And I can see there are these icons here highlighted. If I click more info, there are a few things to show you here. First of all, the curriculum coverage. Uh, I can see in terms of teaching digital systems, this course, the text that's in purple is what's covered in the course, the colorful bold text. So I can see this course teaches a little bit to students about peripherals. And when I hover, I get a more detailed explanation. And also implementation, I can see all the programming concepts that are covered in this course. And the Microbit Sport course does a great job at year five, six of covering everything you would need to cover in programming for students of that age. 
So that's very important information for you there. The other thing you can access from our website is the challenge lesson plan. So let's take a look at that. These lesson plans give you an overview of the course, uh, a bit of the rationale. Maybe if it's a course that encompasses another learning area, you'll find some information in here about that other learning area. It will let you know approximately how long it's expected to take and which content descriptors in the curriculum are covered. So you can see here, we've also done some mapping to the health and physical education Australian curriculum. Gives you a nice overview of what the course covers a breakdown module by module. This course also gives you some vocabulary to work on with students. And then it also includes some extra activities that are not part of the online course, but will reinforce the learning in the course and give you ideas of how you can build out um, the ACA activity, not just to be online computer programming, but to cover other concepts. So this has a really nice activity around abstraction and gives the students the idea that the screen on a micro bit is 25 pixels. What sort of information can you convey with that constraint? How can you draw something that looks like an animal or a dog with 25 pixels? And that's quite fun with the kids, they'll enjoy that. Mm. So these resources here are helpful to you if you think programming's great, but I'd like to include some other DT curriculum um, content descriptors, or I'd like to broaden out the learning a little bit. The lesson plan mm. is where you can come and find that. And some of our other lesson plans will have um, unplugged games, uh, discussion questions, uh, and essentially activities that you can do uh, in addition to students completing the challenge, uh, just to support their learning and help them uh, grasp the concept uh, in a slightly deeper level, but also enabling them to um, access the learning in a, in a number of different ways. So with that overview, that really covers what we wanted to today in terms of introducing you to the DT challenges, um, showing you where you can find them, the support that we have for you as a teacher, and some of the nuts and bolts about how you create accounts and enroll students in the activities. Um, what, where to from here, you are welcome to reach out to us with any questions that you might have. Uh, we have a series of webinars coming up on Monday afternoons, depending on what point in the future you're watching this recording, um, but you can find them all listed on our website. Uh, all of the resources we've talked about today are available at aca.edu.au. Uh, we also have a Facebook group where you can find us at the moment. Uh, that's the place we share things first and we share some new features and ideas in that group, which we might not mention so much in other places. Um, One thing I wanted to mention is that um, all the ACA content uh, is free for students across Australia from years three to eight. Uh, and our cybersecurity content is free for students from year seven to 12. Uh, in terms of the courses that are on the Grok platform, uh, they are free for uh, Australian students till July, is that correct? Nicola? Until the 5th of July. July. Until the 5th of July. But you as a teacher have a free and unlimited access to all the courses on ACA and Grok once you become uh, a verified teacher. So it really is worthwhile doing that extra step of verification uh, because it gives you access to uh, all the content and enables you to see uh, your student progress as well. Thank you, Sajatha. Um, and with that, we wish you well on your DT adventure. Thank you for tuning in today. We are glad that you came along to find out more about what we're doing. Um, please feel free to share this with your colleagues and we look forward to seeing you at another event, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, who knows at this point in time. But thank you for coming along today and we look forward to hearing from you soon and seeing how you engage with our resources. Thank you everyone, bye. Bye.